Uh, dear Earthmates, uh, we are visiting uh, poet and short fiction writer, lecturer, teacher Mildred Parr in the Philippines. Uh, thank you so much for hosting us, uh, dear Mildred Parr. Uh, uh, how, how did your love for poetry begin? Okay, it started when I was young. My father used to tell me stories about everything. And then as I study, I have this fascination for the English language. And then I started to read books and more books and more books. And I was really hooked on, become addicted. And somehow I realized I wanted to have my own story written down. And I took, I took an English major uh, in college and um, it became my, we call this, it became my career. And during the pandemics, uh, I have the chance to really immerse myself on uh, poetry because a friend had led me into one poetic platform and that led to another poetic platform. And so <laughs> I realized I'm enjoying a lot of challenges over there and there. Somehow, I guess it developed my literary skills. Uh, I think this uh, terrible pandemic uh, period uh, in a way, helped uh, writers, poets, to focus on their work. Uh, it led to that, yeah. in my case as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you have won awards in poetry and in short fiction internationally. Yeah. And mm -hmm. your poems have been translated into a number of languages, including Chinese, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Who are some of your favorite poets and writers? Uh, I mean, starting from your early youth. Oh, from early youth, it's Dickinson. <laughs> it's Emily Dickinson. And of course, uh, Shakespeare. Who would not love Shakespeare? But then a number of writers, as I've studied, I discovered a lot. Of course, uh, here is... Uh, Christopher Marlowe and Raleigh, you know, <laughs> uh, who satirizes each other. And then, of course, who would not love um, Ernest Hemingway. And from him, from his story, A Clean and Well-Lighted Place, I developed this love for the name Nada, which I took as my pen name, Nada. Mm. Nada in Spanish means nothing. And I guess I have no expectations. Better to have no expectations so that you can take off from there. So I get I got the name Nada for myself and I use it as my pen name. It was in the work of Ernest Hemingway and a lot of other writers, Ryan Nasuki Akutagawa, Tommy Tom, uh, Morrison, Tommy Morrison. And then a number of writers actually, um, because in my college, we study different uh, literature, world lit, emerging lit, you know. Yes. There. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, and uh, you are teaching the 21st century literature and creative writing. Yeah. And yes. uh, this creative writing, uh, mm -hmm. what is your approach when you teach creative writing? Um, okay. How do you, how do you encourage your students? And what, how mm -hmm. do you lead them? 
basically you teach the elements. First, you have to have the foundation of learning, which is the elements of each of the genre. So we have uh, five genre. We have poetry, prose. We have the novel, the drama, and the essay. So basically, we teach the elements. And after learning the elements, we're going to expose the students to some examples, uh, uh, literary examples of this uh, genre. And then the students can pick up from there. So more exposure to literature. And I also encourage them to go on poetic platform as well, because the poetic platform has a very good, how do you call this, vehicle on which the students can develop themselves. Yes. Wonderful. Um, when um, uh, I think about the Philippines, uh, a few things mm -hmm. come to my mind, like many earthmates or in the other parts of the world, I think. Um, uh, one of them is uh, about uh, the, the Spanish and US imperialism. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the Spanish uh, yeah. empire uh, attacked mm -hmm. the, the Philippines. Right, and then mm -hmm. later on, the U.S. took place something. something. No, <laughs> you know, actually, they they uh, what do you call this? They get in the way of religion. Uh, they did not actually attack like that, but they uh, subjugate Filipinos to religion. They come here with a faith, but. It turned out that well, they just have the women, uh, what do you call this, to have faith and they, and women cannot do, cannot resist anymore. And the women are the mothers and the women are the wives. Therefore, if the women are subjugated, therefore, uh, you might as well, what do you call this, uh, domin, domin, become dominant over the household, you see? Uh, and this goes on for 300 years, you know that. And uh, through religion, they brought us this, uh, what do you call this? Uh, doctrina Christiana, the Christian doctrine. So people cannot resist if the talk is all about God. And then many Filipinos resist. So there are two periods. The first one is the propaganda movement and the other one is the uh, revolution. The propaganda movement started to, or tried to write in a way they can, because we cannot fight with, with anything because we are less uh, armed. So they try to write all about the oppression and write the oppression in Madrid where they can be heard because in Spain, they think us, they think of us as another province or as another state, an extension of their powers. But in the Philippines, these friars became so dominant with powers that they become abusive. So many of our illustrados or the learned Filipinos went abroad and they tried to tell about the plight of the Filipinos here. They even started a uh, newspaper, so La Solidaridad, and uh, they formed brotherhood over there. So somehow uh, the Spaniards know about a lot of Filipinos, but soon it cannot be taken sitting down. You know, they have to raise arms. And was, that was the period of the revolution. Many revolutionists started to fight but how can we fight we have no resources that just like that of the spanish people but through the efforts of filipinos in a way um they've formed an underground movement called the kkk kilosan kataas-taasan kagalang-galangan kilosan ng mga bay ng mamamayan so this is a brotherhood which goes on underground and uh 
the Spaniards cannot uh, cannot follow the movements of the Filipinos. Therefore, they were able to succeed little by little until there is one unified revolution. And it appeared that this revolution becomes, what do you call this? Uh, it's supposed to topple over the Spanish people, but the Spaniards won't bow down to Filipinos. So instead they bow down or they relinquish the power to the American people. You see, there is a conflict of the Americans and it made that they made it appear that they lost to the Americans, not to the Filipinos, when in fact the Filipinos were able to uh, win the war over them. So of course they would not would not accept that Filipinos will be above them all. So instead they uh, relinquished the power to America. Wow. And uh, there is a then they they have this uh um, Treaty of Paris, wherein uh, the um, the uh, what do you call this? The Spanish people pay the Americans, I think twenty thousand dollars only <laughs> for the damages of war, but uh, it becomes like uh, they they had to what they had to surrender the Philippines to the Americans, so the Americans appeared to be friends, allies, but only in appearance because the Americans were the next one to colonize Filipinos in way of education, language. So they appeared to be brothers, but then still the Philippines had a lot of natural resources and very rich at that. So most of the countries are, you know, really after the natural resources and, and, you know, they succeeded in that way. They become allies. Up until now, we cannot uh, really go out of the clutch of these people, of this uh, nation. So we are like poor, getting poorer because they are like uh, somehow dominating. <laughs> I think, yeah. uh, one of my favorite authors since my childhood has been Mark Twain and um, oh. um, as I was reading about uh, Nikola Tesla uh, to oh. write something about Tesla I learned that Mark Twain in the year nine, nine, 1900 established and uh, uh, American Anti-Imperialist Association mm -hmm. in the United States. And he said, <clears throat> um, uh, we should not treat uh, the Philippines like the Spaniards did. The, let the, mm -hmm. Fli uh, the Philippines be independent. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. Mark Twain was against the US imperialism. This is very important. Mm -hmm. And I do not know if in the schools in the United States, they teach this to the kids. I don't think they do. Oh. So Mark Twain mm -hmm. uh, was not only a great satirist, a humorist, but he was uh -huh. anti-imperialist uh -huh. intellectual, uh, an honest mm -hmm. world citizen. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that's, uh, I wanted to mention it. And, <clears throat> Um, how is the uh, uh, in, international relations of the Philippines? I mean, for example, with China. Okay, okay, this is the problem now. Uh, but then, anyway, I must I must comment our president, uh, President Raúl Duterte. His leadership is very solid now, unlike the the past. But then. Uh, we have this, what do you call this? Bittersweet relationship with China because uh, Duterte doesn't want to side with America. And so it's a, it's a choice between two evils, if I mention. It's a choice between the devil and the deep blue sea because uh, we have nowhere to go. 
we are indebted to US, really, literally in debt. Okay, but in China, um, China is uh, in a way also uh, doing business in the Philippines and somehow encroaching much in the market. You know, they are somehow uh, capitalizing on the on their supremacy over the Philippines. Philippines had not much money. We know that, although we do not have recession, but Philippines had uh, no, we call this no finances. And so uh, China had their business in the Philippines and almost encroached. And somehow they are claiming some of the parts of the Philippines, you know, and we can do anything about that. The relationship regarding territory is getting worse and Filipinos are losing part of the territory and we cannot do anything about that. Losing and China? the U.S. Losing territory huh? to China? Yes, the Chinese. They are, we, are, we are having some claims over the, what do you call that, shoal. And there are, I guess, I guess three countries uh, claiming the shoal, but the Chinese territory encroach on that shoal and slowly, you know, hampering or putting some limits on the territory of the Philippines. Um, in pressure. And uh, yes, yes. And some of our fishermen are not allowed to fish over there. In fact, it's part of our territory, but they're claiming it. And that's one big issue regarding Chinese people. Even in the Philippines, they're doing business here and they are slowly, they call this claiming, like in Manila, they are having this banner that this is the ownership of China, something like that. But the uh, Duterte do not want the American as well. He also hate the Americans as well because uh, we are, we are, in a way, we are being owned by American people, and uh, somehow, <laughs> you know, uh, we cannot move properly because we are in debt. Somehow, like that, we are being controlled. Like, you know, you want more support, then there are some. What call this? There are some price. Uh, There's a price for it. Compromise. 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 There are some compromise to be held because uh, we need support. Okay. No. Much more during the Yolanda times. The Yolanda is a very massive storm that happened in the Philippines and Cebu, for that matter. One of the islands within the Philippines was clearly devastated by storm. And so we needed support. And the American government gave support, but there is a compromise, you know. Uh, that's the thing. Um, clearly, it appears there's no compromise, but then there's a lot of hidden agenda in which the government had to go through just to get the support. So that's a problem. And it's not open to Filipinos, not open to common Filipinos. So we think as if we are free, but, uh, you know, the country is uh, all indebted to these countries. Yes. How about India? Uh, what do you think of the relationship between India and uh, the I think I think there's a good relationship. Uh, between the Indian people and the government, because the business, uh, business, business-wise, most Indians are almost occupying a very big area in Manila. So, and you know, these Indians are very, I think, are very industrious. They go here, and they only brought motorcycle with them, and they have a brotherhood. One thing I can comment about Indian people is that they help their people. They help the people, they come here without anything and then through the help of their brothers, 
they were able to do business. You know, most of the Filipinos are lazy. I must say that. And, you know, the Filipinos uh, would rather go by himself and would not ask help, very much proud to help from fellow brothers, some help. But Indian people, I can see, are very industrious and they really do help their brothers when they come here and then they do business. Soon they will be having a good business. And I even have students who are Indian, you know. <laughs> And uh, I was like, I was so happy teaching them. But then how can you teach Indians the Filipino culture? You have to start from the roots. <laughs> but Filipinos and Indians have a good relationship, I guess. It's just that I know. And Australia, of course, is also important, I guess. Yes, uh, Australia also. Mm. Um, by the way, uh, uh, um, I was going to say something. Uh, what are the religions apart from, mm -hmm. I think, Catholicism, mm -hmm. uh, I, of the Spanish influence? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what are there uh, some. Uh, Basically, Basically, the Filipinos are um, Catholic and some different forms of Christianity, but mostly uh, the other island, which is Mindanao, is basically Muslim because they are exposed to India, Indonesia and Malaysia, which are basically Muslims. Therefore, they are also Muslim because they, they just have to go over uh, the sea or the river, and they are doing business with Indonesian and with the Malaysian people. So the second largest is, is uh, Muslim. We even celebrate even the Ramadan and even the, the end of the Ramadan, the El Fitir, but also because we have a lot of Chinese. So basically, we also have Buddhism, you know, and Bangladesh now is slowly gaining ground, you know. <laughs> Bangladesh also is gaining ground on business sector. And that is very evident on the big areas for business in Divisoria, in Baklaran, and in different parts of the country. But basically, uh, Mindanao is more on the Muslim side. And the Muslim are even gaining grounds within in within Luzon. So I can say uh, our people are so diverse that we easily take in some culture that sometimes we are being, you know, people do not understand that slowly you are being dominated. Slowly you are because you are like accepting everything and you are losing your own cultural filament so, you know, Philippines is like losing the core, the core culture. That's what I'm not so happy about because we have so much diverse culture coming in and we welcome all of them. Philippines is a hot, hot pot of or microcosm of all these cultures. We have a lot or a little bit of everything, but not so much solid core. That's what I'm so... Uh, disappointed about. Mm. How about the Filipino language? <clears throat> the only thing I know is that there's no F sound because mm -hmm. when I was in Saudi Arabia teaching English, we had a lot of uh, Filipino friends and they would say Filipino and, uh, and- They say. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so- They say. I know. Sorry. Um, would you please say a few things in uh, the Filipino language or Filipino mm -hmm. language? Actually, Filipinos, they say Filipino is a true language. Why? Because one sound, one symbol, and a meaning. Unlike in English, you have different sounds, like different sounds of A. Okay. In Filipino, you say, 
maganda ka. Beautiful. Maganda ka. There's no other sound of A instead of A, E, E, O, U. So the vowels have no other sound except those sounds. So they say it's strong language. And uh, our grammar, okay, our grammar is the other side is what is an exact opposite of the English language. Even English, it's SVO, subject, verb, object. In us, it's object, verb, and subject. So that's the normal way of things. Like, uh, Nena is washing clothes. In us, it's naglalabas si Nena. So you perform first before you say who is the performer. <laughs> okay. And like in the English language, you say first the performer before the action being taken. So but I think Filipino is very easy to learn because it's somehow the same with the English language. Our alphabet is, is the same. Mm. So a Turkish person can learn uh, your language quite easily yes. because the Turkish grammar structure is the same like yours. We also have the object. For example, in English, you say, I'm going to the cinema. And in mm. Turkish, cinema ya gidiyorum. Cinema ya uh, suffix mm -hmm. uh, to cinema, to the cinema. Mm -hmm. Gidiyor, going, mm -hmm. am I. And I comes at the end, like okay. your language. Interesting, mm -hmm. I didn't know. Yes, that. the same. The same. Uh, basically, our in the in the uh, constitution, what is said in the constitution is our medium is Filipino and unless otherwise English. That makes us bilingual, actually. Very good. And there is another article which says that we also would encourage the intellectualization of the language. Uh, including other languages existing in the Philippines. And of course, we are a conglomeration of India because in the past, you know, first is this is the Chinese, then come the Japanese, then the Indian people. So our language is composed of all these things. And in ourselves, we have, I think, many other languages. Uh, and they were like in the commission of language, of Filipino language, they are having like, they wanted it to revise because they said that in the 19, 1937, 1937 constitution, they say that uh, the language which was based was the Filipino, the Tagalog base, which is from Luzon. We have three major islands, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So Luzon is where Manila is or the center. It's a big, big island. And the second largest island is Visaya. Mostly uh, English speaking people in Visaya. And then Mindanao is mostly Muslim because the neighboring countries, you know. And they say that Tagalog language is purely based on Luzon. So they are like raising contention. Why do you have to base it on Luzon? We have a lot of literature from other provinces like Hiligaynon, Bicolano. So there are a lot of languages in the Philippines because of the many islands. And why do you have to base it only on Tagalog? So they have to revise the language. They have to study and uh, create a commission on language. Thereby the language became Filipina with an F, Filipino. It incorporates the other, other alphabet or the other letters. Hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and we have to incorporate the language. And before we, we only read like, uh, like what you said, it's like, or like what I said, I, A, E, O. But then now we have to, for example, in Chinese, we have Xiao Mai, Xiao Pao, <laughs> and Pansit. From uh, from the Indian, we have calendario, pajama. And from the Spanish, we have cilia, we have sabon. So many of these languages are interconnected or intertwined with our language already. You cannot separate them. So we, 
we made it our own. Wonderful. And many Filipinos, by the way, are speaking pigeonized Spanish, you know, because of the many years of being under the Spanish rule. Therefore, they, they use pigeonized and we call it, uh, what do you call it? I forgot. There's a call, there's a term for the pigeonized Spanish. And even, you know, and even most of the Filipinas are using Taglish. <laughs> you know, Taglish, like Tonglish, Korean English, or Taglish, Tagalog English. And uh, as long as we understand each other, although you may say that in education or in school, there's, there's supposed to be no code switching. When you say code switching is like changing the language from English to Filipino and from Filipino to English in one sentence. They are like making a mixture of the language. And nowadays, you know, texting, texting and the innovation of the internet. Uh, many kids do not know anymore Filipino. They, what they know is uh, <laughs> what it pigeonized, <laughs> pigeonized or the, uh, the language brought by the internet. They can speak English. They didn't know it's English because they thought it was Filipino. And, and you know, in the problem there is that when you ask them to write down, they cannot really write down pure Filipino. At least on my term, on my contemporary, we know how to distinguish uh, English or other languages in Filipino. I can write Filipino pure and I can write pure English. But nowadays I doubt it because students much better know text language than Filipino language. So that's the problem also. And of course, language should be intellectualized, right? And um, the problem there is that's a common thing among the young ones. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and um, in, uh, when we look at Turkish, um, in addition to your uh, the five vowels, A, E, I, O, U, there is U, E, U. So Italian and Filipino languages, uh, they, they have the, similar, uh, the same uh, vowels. And in Turkey, yeah. uh, we see a lot of uh, Arabic, Persian words, plus mm -hmm. uh, French. Uh, mm -hmm. It's interesting, no German words, although Turkey and Germany have had a long relationship. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, Atatürk, you know, maybe changed the alphabet from the Arabic-based alphabet to mm -hmm. Latin-based alphabet, which is wonderful. One of the wonderful mm -hmm. changes he made. Very nice, right? And, um, Filipino, we have, we have here some languages which are like, like, and um, as you see, we have a lot of languages and they have this, not all Filipinas have the true language, like what we talk about. Others are like, the sound which is uh. <laughs> and uh, you know it's difficult for me to utter their language because I was not born with it. My tongue is not accustomed to these things, and like they say in a bill, uh, <laughs> and in our own word it will be pinakbet. It's a delicacy which is composed of anchovies and and vegetables. And for them, it's like, <laughs> so I was I was amused because when I travel over there, you know, when I travel there, the first thing I learned was, uh, what did you say again? Did, did I know that language? Did I know that word? Did I know that dish? And when they show me the dish, oh, this is bed. They, they were saying, the boot. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, in, in one culture, they are like always angry when they are talking because they seem to be shouting with each other. But it's just their normal way of talking. Uh, 
in Iloilo or in Ilongo, they are so sweet. Even though they are fighting, they're like caressing each other with their speeches. You know, this way things are. And there were there were some groups of people or some ethical groups which are like speaking like birds. By the way, I have to tell you some interesting things, you know. During the time of Imelda Marcos, uh, 1970s, the reign of Marcoses, you know, I super admire Marcos. There will be no president like him ever in the Philippines. Uh, he is very intelligent, but, but the thing is the cronies and the other people surrounding him corrupted him at the end of his term, okay? That's, but during the time of Marcos, the very beautiful wife, Imelda, she is for the beauty. <laughs> Her tagline is like, uh, the good, the true, and the beautiful, okay? Something like that. So when there will be a, uh, what do you call this? And there is a, uh, she invited peop uh, people from different countries to the Philippines to have interest in the Philippines. The thing is she had uh, started building, uh, what do you call this? Uh, theaters and all these things, like for the elite, you know? <laughs> She built palaces, she built uh, theaters. And during the time it was being, being built, it was uh, being built on haste. Therefore, when it's on a haste, people's are, people are, you know, uh, pe many people died because of the collapse of the building being built. And because of the haste, they just do not bury people. They just continue with the work. How inhumane, you know? So most of these workers are buried alive on the building. Another thing she did is to get interest for the people. And I've learned this, you know, sometimes we have to rewrite history. And during that time, there was, there was an interest on some ethnic group Okay, they have this language with a costume, uh, with a native costume. And they have their own particular cultural heritage. It turned out it was a hoax. What do you mean by hoax? It turned out it was just built, uh, was just made up to have some interest with, to, to uh, what? to build some interest on these people, you know, because they made it appear that they are discovered, that they are ethnic tribe discovered. And it turned out it's just made up. So, and they tried to, one thing about it is they tried to beautify Philippines and cover the slums with galvanized iron, so. It's like the true, the good, and the beautiful, but actually they're just hiding away the truth. And they are dancing, singing with the elite. But during those times, those are the glory days of the Filipinos. But after their rule, they are now the collapse of the economy of the Filipino. Because yes, you build interest, but you didn't gain too much of returns. The thing is, you have so much invested on these things like international relations, but the thing is it should be converted to something tangible, it could be uh, converted to something much more of gain for the Filipinos. But it seems they just enjoy the power and those after them, those cronies they have so, Sooner the people smelled the fishy thing and you know there comes the election and he was ousted actually. I remember that I was in Saudi Arabia working there yeah. and uh, yes. Um, actually it's a glory thing for the Filipino because it's a peaceful revolution. Imagine people, nuns going to the, against the tanks and giving the soldiers food, flowers and everything. 
So how can a Filipino go against it? So we are fellow Filipino. We cannot go against our own countrymen. So the Marcos has to leave. He has to step down from power because, you know, Filipinos love each other. Although we are, although we can say that we are very relaxed with our culture. Although we can say that we have a lot of negative impact on ourselves. But one thing about Filipinos, we are lovers of our own people. We, we love each other. And, you know, uh, in the end, love still survives within us. And uh, it is what makes us what, whole, standing, even though we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of problems. And all those Spaniards, I may say Spaniards uh, uh, dominated or what do you call this? Uh, prostitute, <laughs> prostitute right. of Philippines, but still with their, with their religion, but still they instilled something of religion on the hearts of the Filipinos. Uh, it's also good that we fear for some higher beings because if not, you know, what will happen is chaotic. So somehow I believe that it also helps that we have somehow a belief or a faith, even though quite shallow sometimes, but still in our hearts, there, are, there is still some belief on something that can save us. We call it bahala na, you know. Bahala na came from the word bathala na or let God and let go. <laughs> somehow it becomes positive somehow because if you have something going on and you are like uh, fearful about the outcome, then you say let God and let go. But somehow it becomes negative because it makes people slot or lazy. Because they will just say, anyway, let God and let go. So it works both ways. Let God, you know, let God work. Let God work in our lives. And we are safe from anxiety. But on the other hand, let God. They, they, they make God do the work and <laughs> they just sleep. They just, they just, most of the Philippines are happy-go-lucky, you know. They just drink even in the morning or somehow they have vices. But not all Filipinos are like that. I can say a lot of Filipinos are also good. So I think. <laughs> yes, uh, it, every belief has its uh, advantages and disadvantages, I think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, I personally, uh, I consider myself a naturalist. I do not have... Uh, mm -hmm. I do not think that there is a higher being other than nature. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the uh, Philippines uh, is a republic, and uh, and uh, there are elections, uh, you know, and uh, I guess relatively democratic. We can mm -hmm. see, um, uh, and the big population, right? Yes. We have a very big population. That's one thing about it. They cannot control the population. They cannot control the population. They did some uh, some measures for population control, but still, you know, um, somehow the problem there is the lower level of status, the lower level of Filipino status, or the lower status level. The lower pe the people in the lower status, they are the the ones who produce much of spring because somehow they do it like a hobby. And those who are in the elite section, they do not have much time. They go for the business and they don't have much time to produce. So somehow the poor are the ones who populate the more. And, okay. and uh, what is in the a way they are doing now? something about it. Mm. What is the population about? It's 109 million. Yes, more than Still million, million, not billions, but somehow it's big, yes. you know, because Manila is highly dense. 
And because Manila is the center, more people go in Manila and the problem there, they are not secure and they don't have any security going there and still they go. So most of them just becomes a liability. Uh, but then the government did something to bring them back to their provinces. In fact, they helped them, give them funds for their life to start anew in the provinces. But, you know, the beauty of the city, the call of the city, the lights of the city attracts the people. And I'm so lucky I'm in a suburban area. I'm just 33 kilometers away from Manila and it's easier for me to transport. So I enjoy both worlds. I enjoy being in a province and I enjoy being in the city. So. I have no problem like that. But most of the people in the provinces, they really love, they really love to get a glimpse of the city because the life there is maybe easy, but uh, the, the beauty and the pulsating beauty of life is in the city. That's why more people wanted to be there, but it's so highly dense. So there are so many urban, urban poor, and they are causing a problem because if they have been back to the provinces, maybe I guess their lives would not be like difficult. Most of them going to, uh, you know, uh, illegal, illegal uh, jobs, you know, but they, I, I guess they prefer to have illegal jobs and go back to their, you know, I guess it's the access to this uh, light <laughs> or the access to this, what the sights and the experience, the glory of being in the city. I may not understand them because as I told you, I enjoy both worlds. I enjoy, and I don't have much access to those poor ones because in our place we are quite comfortable and I'm so lucky with that I've been comfortable in my life. Wonderful and uh, uh, what would you like to recommend or suggest to young earthmates uh, on our planet? Mm -hmm. What would you like to say to them? Mm -hmm. I guess we go back to the nature. Uh, I guess they rather first, if ever they have something done against nature, they should, or if there were, if ever there is a transgress transgression on nature, we should somehow repay. Uh, if ever you cut trees and therefore you have to plant them. Conservation of energy, conservation of this, uh, natural resources. Although water is available, but clean water is not, right? That's the problem, the concept of people regarding water, because there was a time in the Philippines that we have like, no, we have like a, an impending problem with water. And although you are saying, you can say that there are so many flooded areas, but these are, this doesn't help. The dams are filled with flooded water, but not potable water. And you need so much money to clean the water, you know? Uh, That's a problem. The concept of many young generation, they just feel that it's a privilege to live and not a responsibility. Every privilege should come with responsibility. Whatever you do, you enjoy, therefore you pay or you you uh, give give back as simple as that, right? Uh, whatever you take, you have to give back. So somehow that thing, and also education. I'm into education, you know, but I really wanted uh, the young generation to be educated that they are not here on earth just to enjoy life. And, you know, many young children are watching the internet and are, in a way, influenced. They feel that uh, their masculinity 
uh, should be imposed, but not your your uh, what do you call this? Your uh, rights ends. Okay, your rights ends. Uh, when it comes to others' rights, others have rights too that you violate when you push on whatever you wanted to do. So what I hope is that young generation will be educated. They should be educated that for every freedom, you have your responsibility. Now, Spider-Man is very good. <laughs> Spider-Man says that for every, uh, what do you call it? For every freedom, just responsibility. Somehow like that, you know? And you have to really educate yourself, not just what is given to you in school. Do not just sit down and relax and just let things happen to you. No, we should be proactive. We must learn. We must be the one to discover this world. We are here. We are going to live in this world. Therefore, we discover what is there for us. We tap our abilities. We tap our energies. Because if you're just going to sit down and wait, you know, <laughs> you know, Juan Tamad, by the way, by the way, we have a representative in our kind of which, which we know as Juan de la Cruz. Juan de la Cruz is shown as one having a hat, okay, a booty hat and very white, white long sleeve shirt and red pants. He's a very common Filipino, Juan de la Cruz. But on the other side, we have Juan Tamad. Tamad means lazy, okay? Like he is portrayed as somebody who will sleep under the guava tree and let the guava fall on him. And he will just chew the guava. So how, how lazy can you get? But it's like a satire, you know? It's a satirical character of the many Filipinos who think that life is given on them so many things that they don't have to move an inch so that they can get their feet, you know. So the thing, I, I would like to educate fellow Filipinos. Yes. Yeah, and the, the, the whole world needs that. Thank you so much, dear Mildred <laughs> Parr. I've learned a lot from you and mm -hmm. I am happy that uh, we're together on the uh, Earth Civilization Network. Uh, we, yeah. we can share information and ideas, yeah. and improve our synergy for a better yeah. world, uh, for a better civilization. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much also. <laughs> yeah. uh, dear Earthmates, um, we are grateful to Mildred Pa for her uh, hospitality in the Philippines and uh, uh, we all have a lot to learn uh, from her from each other and we're together that's mm -hmm. I enjoy saying this at the end we're together okay see mabuhay that was what we normally say mabuhay live that live